Hello, friends, and welcome to part two of my Omnipod 5 series with Carrie Burgett. Before we get started today with part two of this three-part series, I'd like to tell you that Inslet has paid the host of this podcast, that's me, Scott Benner, and my guest, Carrie Burgett, a fee to create this content. Carrie is an Omnipod ambassador with an ongoing commercial relationship with Insulate. This podcast provides general information and discussions about health and related subjects. This information and other content provided in this podcast or in any linked materials are not intended and should not be construed as medical advice, nor is the information a substitute for professional medical expertise or treatment. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it because of something that you've heard in this podcast or read in any linked materials. The opinions and views expressed on this podcast and website have no relation to those of any academic, hospital, health practice, or other institution. Please speak with your healthcare team if you or any person has a medical concern and before making any changes to your diabetes management. You can always consult the Omnipod 5 Automated Insulin Delivery System User Guide for more information. In short, nothing you hear on the Juice Box Podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan. You are about to listen to part two of this series, Omnipod 5 Pro Tip Settings. If you didn't begin with Omnipod 5 Pro Tip Overview, you should have. That's the first one. This is the second one. And then the third and final is Omnipod 5 Pro Tip Connectivity. All three episodes came out at the same time, and so they should be in your podcast player in order. They are also available at juiceboxpodcast.com forward slash Omnipod 5. And we're going to have to do like a little thing here, Carrie, but that pretends we haven't talked in a while. So, hey, Carrie, how are you? <laughs> Doing great, Scott. Good, we're back. How about you? Oh my gosh, it's been so long since I saw you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for us to be together again. Do you think people know we just recorded these all in a row? Probably, right? <laughs> probably, they yeah, probably know. Okay. People know things. <laughs> yeah, they know things. Mm -hmm. People understand. Uh, yeah. We're going to really kind of dig down into Omnipod 5 system settings right now. And, you know, hopefully everybody's listened to the first episode. If you haven't, head back over and... and take a look. I think listening to them in order would really be most valuable. So Carrie, I guess we should just introduce you one more time. That makes mm, sense. Go ahead. Okay. You know what I mean? Like for people who yeah. are like, oh, why should I even go back and listen to the first one, Scott? Who is this person you have with you? Oh, well, this person, that would be me. So I'm Carrie and I'm a nurse from the Barbara Davis Center in Colorado. And I work with kids and their parents on diabetes technologies. I literally spend nearly all of my time helping people with their insulin pumps. So yeah, that's right. who I am. Okay. And you'll tell your, more about yourself in the first episode if they haven't heard it already. Yes. Yeah. So if, in a rambly way that everyone will enjoy. Because you're much not. less nervous now than you were <laughs> when we started the other one, correct? Yeah. Yes. I think you need to edit that part. No, 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 no. That's my favorite part. And that stays in. And everybody, um, everybody who comes on is nervous in the beginning. So you didn't mm -hmm. get the benefit of what all the other people on the show get, which is like a nice 10 minute conversation where I talk about like silly things to get you comfortable before we start. We had to jump right in with you. But I thought mm -hmm. you did terrific. And uh, you're a seasoned professional at this point. So let's let's oh. get going with this, okay? Okay. All right. So we're going to start with basal insulin when we're thinking about settings, right? So the question is, do you program basal settings when you go through the initial setup? And does changing basal rates later impact the algorithm? Okay. So first, yes, you have to program basal rates in order to use the system at all. And the basal rates that you program, though, are not used when you are in automated mode. They're only used when you are in manual mode pump operation. Mm -hmm. With that being said, with the first pod, it will look at the total basal that you have programmed to estimate a total daily insulin. Um, so you do want to make sure that you know the basal rates that are programmed are actually um, reflective of what you... Um, you know, would need. So about 40 to 50% of your total insulin needs, but it does not use the actual rates themselves. So um, important to keep that in mind. So this is incredibly important for two uh, distinct reasons, right? The first one is 
the amount you put in for your basal rate is going to be where the algorithm begins to understand your adaptive basal rate as it's learning. But probably, I don't want to say more importantly, but but equally as important is that if you ever have to go back into manual mode, this is these are the settings that will be used. Yes. Okay. I would agree with all that. Mm-hmm. Right. So I can't like I can't just like make up a number. Like I got to put in a good solid number best best number I can come up with based on my settings. Something I can get from my doctor um, is where to begin. Right. Okay. Absolutely. You definitely don't want to just make something up because you you know if you were in manual mode, those are the the rates that you're going to get. So yeah, I just want to be clear because it, it's a it's almost a it feels like there's an interesting duality where you're like, listen, it's very mm-hmm. important to put in the basal rates, but the algorithm's going to ignore them pretty soon anyway. So, you know, yeah. right? Yeah, I just, I definitely see that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Perfect. Okay. So after the first pod, system's going to gather up all my insulin history, and it's going to make a, an update to this adaptive basal rate, right? Yep. Okay. So now once we're into automated mode, does adjusting the basal rates do anything for automated? No. Zero, nada. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I, I I can't emphasize it enough that changing the basal rates does absolutely nada. Okay. So what's going to happen is I use a pod, the pod learns, and then when I put on a new pod, it makes an adjustment then based on what it's learned in the previous pod. Is that correct? That is correct. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's actually, I'm I'm like, wow. When you put it like that, who thought of that? <laughs> you know? I know. It yeah. is actually really cool. It's like, right. how much insulin did you get? We're going to update that that baseline rate. Right. It's, yeah. It just really is interesting. So uh, I guess a couple extra points is that it's going to be really important then for how you bolus. And, you know, covering your carbs correctly, using corrections when you see corrections are necessary. These are all going to help the algorithm to understand what your total daily insulin is. Yes. Okay. That is all correct. All right. Good. Look at you. You're just like, you know, if you I got say, it. If That's I all say correct. I don't wrong, even know what else to say. I'm waiting for when I say something. You're just like, yo, whoa, man, hold on. Oh, That's I'll not- tell you. <laughs> I will tell you if it's wrong. All right. So um, I'm just going to read this actually because all insulin delivery methods work in different ways. So keep that in mind that the rates and the ratios you used before may change with Omnipod 5. And that's okay, right? So you got to review your current doses with your healthcare provider. And your Omnipod trainer before you start with Omnipod 5. Fair yes. enough. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's, yeah. let's hit a couple of questions from people. This person says, when you see that you're using 50% less basal than what you have inputted. So now this person's saying, look, I told it my basal rate was this. Mm. But I'm looking and it's taking basal away. They said, what are they supposed to do? <laughs> and the way they asked the question was, do I change it to match or do I leave it alone? And so I guess what they're saying is, what if I told it, my basal rate is one unit an hour, but then they look and they see they're really getting half of that, just as an example. Do they have to go back in and tell it? And I, I'm going to say no, right? Yeah. I, it, well, it depends. It depends on your goal. So as far as the audit, whatever's happening with your automated insulin delivery, if it's all working and, and you know, you just see that you're getting half the total amount of basal than what you have programmed Mm -hmm. in for manual mode, then, you know, and it's working and you're, you know, getting the control that, you know, you want, then yeah, you don't need to do anything. Yeah. But if you were going to, if you want your manual mode rates to be correct or as best as they can be, you know, you might want to take a look at those manual rates and just say like, huh, maybe I'm way off on what these actually should be right. if I were to be in manual mode. So I would encourage a conversation with, um, you know, your healthcare provider about that, because if you were, you know, let's say you couldn't get your Dexcoms for, you know, whatever reason, because this kind of stuff happens, then you're going to be in manual mode. So you want to make sure that those manual mode rates are, you know, somewhat effective for right. you. Because your insulin to carb ratio, correction factor, uh, reverse correction factor, all that stuff, you you want that right in case you go back into manual. Yeah, you yeah. would want all of it right, and you would want your basal rates to be you know appropriate for you. Um, you know, if you were in manual mode, right? But but it's not going to touch the the automation at all. Right, changing the basal rates will not have any impact 
on the adaptive basal or how much insulin the algorithm is giving in the, you know, the automated insulin delivery algorithm. Gotcha. Here's the next question from somebody. They said, well, what about the max basal setting? Like, would I be helping the system to deliver more insulin in automated mode if I jacked up the max basal? This is a great question. I get this question all the time. And the answer is no. So the real simple answer is no. Um, if you want me to ramble about it a little bit more, I can tell you yeah, yeah. that the max basal rate setting is it's really a safety setting and it's a manual mode setting. Um, it's helping make sure really like keystroke errors is really how I tell people because what, what the setting actually means is whatever rate you program in the max basal setting, the pump will not let you program a basal rate any higher than that. That includes temporary basal rates if you were in manual mode. Mm -hmm. um, so really, like if you meant to put in 0.2 for a basal rate and you actually accidentally did 2.0, you know, having this max basal setting, you know, appropriately set kind of helps prevent that user error. So um, it's a manual mode only setting. Which is a safety setting and it has nothing to do with the impact on the algorithm. Exactly. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. So target glucose, right? Um this is adjustable on Omnipod 5, and, and I think we want to understand it better. So target glucose, anywhere between 110 and 150, in, 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 10, in increments of 10, right? I could do 110, yes. 120, increments 130, of 10. 40, mm -hmm. 150. That I can adjust, but, but that's you, – you, you said it in the, in the other episode, and I thought you said it really eloquently, but it doesn't mean you're going to be 110 constantly. You could end up being lower. You could end up being higher. It's just the system is always sort of adjusting to get back to that spot of 110. It's it's the target of it. Yeah. Nothing more or less than that. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And so, you know, when I think about the target, if you want the if you want the uh, the adaptive basal to operate as aggressive as possible, if you want to get the most amount of insulin that you can, go with 110 because that's the lowest setting. That's where you will get the most aggressive, um, insulin delivery. And most people do really well with 110. I mean, I use 110 as the default, unless there's some other reason not to, um, a lot of times based maybe on personal preference. If somebody just conceptually is not feeling comfortable with that and they want it to be a little higher. Mm -hmm. Um, but really 110 is that's your lowest option. That's where you're going to get the most insulin delivery. And then, you know, being able to go 120, 130, 140, 150, it also gives you a little bit of input and a little bit of an ability to influence how much um, automated insulin delivery you get. So instead of being like, oh, do I want to be at 120 or do I want to be at 130? I would instead think of it as, do I feel like I need more insulin delivery or less insulin delivery than what I'm getting from this automation? And if you're running higher than you would like at a certain time of day, then and it doesn't seem to be really related to the bolus doses, then that's just a, that's one way that you can directly influence the um, adaptive basal. And I'm sorry, I keep using like automated insulin delivery and adaptive basal. It's really all the same thing. I just am referring to the insulin that is automated right. from the system. Now, there's also another value that you're in control of, right? Correct above. Yeah. And the correct above is used just for correction boluses that you go and give that the user gives with the bolus calculator. Okay. Um, and so I, cause I should mention the target glucose now serves two purposes in automated mode. Mm -hmm. It's the target for the bolus calculator, but it's also the target for the adaptive basal. Right. So they, they go together. So you, they're always, there's just one setting, but they serve, it serves both those purposes. Um, correct above can go anywhere from 110 to 150 in 10 unit um, increments as well. Is that and so? Let me ask you: Is that just for automated, or is it just for manual? Is it for both? Uh, that's for both. Okay. Yeah, because it's a bolus calculator setting, which is available in both manual and automated mode. So, can, let me break that down for a second. So, if yeah. if my target's set at 110 and the algorithm predicts I'm going to go over 110, it will take steps to stop that from happening. But if I'm 100 and I have a meal and I put in, I don't know, 10 carbs, it's going to give me the insulin for the 10 carbs. If I'm 110, it'll give me the insulin for the 10 carbs. But if I'm 
40 and I've got my correct above set at 110, it's going to give me the carbs plus the 30 points between 110 and 140? Yeah, think of it this way. Whatever the correct above is, that's when the bolus calculator considers you eligible for a correction bolus calculation. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, if your correct above is set at 140, it's not even going to calculate. It's not even going to the trouble of calculating a correction bolus for you. Um, so, so the difference between the correct above and the target is that the correct above is when you're eligible for the correction, when the calculator will add in and do that calculation and add it to the dose versus one, the target is what it will aim for. So if your correct above is 110, I'm sorry, your correct above is 140, you'll get the calculation added if you're above 140, but it's going to calculate it aiming for the target, which is 110. Let me ask you a question that I, I feel like I noticed this one um, with Omnipon 5 with Arden, and I want to make sure I saw it correctly. Let's say I have uh, a blood sugar that's sitting at 150. If you mm-hmm. go into the into where you bolus and your correct above is lower than 150, it will actually suggest the amount of insulin to you to bolus. Is that correct? Yes. But it was your question if you go in, if you say that again, I'm sorry. You go actually right into where you make a bolus and yeah. you, and you, you sort of say to it like, Hey, I'm here. And it says, well, I think you should put in 0.3 right now. And that's even without carbs. I, I consistently yeah. felt like I got that, but it won't give you the, the, uh, I'm making up numbers now, but it won't give you the 0.3 automatically. Right. Right. A bolus dose has to be directed by the user. Got it. So the calculator will recommend to you, like it'll populate in the um, dose row, how much it wants you to give based on the calculation. Mm-hmm. And then you have to press the button to say, deliver it. So the algorithm will try to give me that insulin over time. It just won't give it to me all at once unless I override it and say, go ahead and put this in. Well, it's not really the algorithm though. This is bolus doses. This is user given boluses. So those are calculated based on your programmed settings. So Mm -hmm. the correction factor, the target, um, if it's a correction dose. So if you, if you, um, if you use the CGM value, if you put a glucose value in the bolus calculator, then it's going to calculate a bolus for the blood sugar correction based on what's programmed in the pump. If you put in carbs, it's going to calculate a dose based on the insulin to carb ratio. But keep in mind, it also subtracts insulin on board. So, you know, that's a part of the calculation. So it could be that you put in a high blood sugar and it still populates with zero or something that seems small. And that's because if you have a lot of insulin on board, that insulin on board might be more than what the calculated dose is. And so it's telling you that it doesn't think you need to give anything more. Okay. I don't want to drill down too far into like minutia, but I want to make sure that I'm clear because if I'm clear, then everybody else is going to be clear too. So if I go into the bolus calculator and it says, hey, you should bolus 0.3 right now without any carbs being added, Uh why is it not giving me the 0.3 or am I misunderstanding what you said? Oh, you're saying why isn't the algorithm going to give you the 0.3? Yes, yes, yes. That's what you're asking. Oh, okay. Well, because the algorithm has certain, I mean- certain constraints, which is why I say you should go to the bolus calculator if your glucose value is higher than you want it to be. Yes. Because I I guarantee you that the algorithm is trying to bring the insulin down. But again, it's still conceptually, it's basal insulin that's also trying to help with hyperglycemia. And so it's not necessarily always going to be able to do that without you going in and giving the bolus. It'll probably get there eventually, but it'll take longer because it's right. every five minutes having to, you know, give these micro boluses. Um, I also think it's helpful to conceptually look at the basal delivery because in the um, CGM graph, you can visually see that if you're at maximum delivery and as far as the algorithm is concerned. Okay. And a lot of times in these cases, your glucose is high and you go and look and you're at maximum delivery, you realize it's working as hard as it, it actually can. Mm -hmm. It can't go any higher than what it's doing. Um, and so that's why it probably can't give that 0.3 it's reached its limit, but it thinks based on the settings you have programmed in the bulls calculator that you probably could benefit from an additional 0.3. So 
Okay. Why don't you just go ahead and give that point Makes three? Perfect. Sense. I probably did not lay it out correctly the first time. That is exactly what I was wondering. Okay. Oh, so, good. Okay. So let's dig into carb ratios and correction factor for a second. So we got two settings here. They function, you know, the same way as they would in, you know, in another system, right? Yeah. Um, so whether you're using another pump, using an algorithm, using Olipod 5, or using MDI, these things mean the same thing. So it's not uncommon for people to need to do what? Strengthen their carb ratios when starting on an automated insulin system like Omnipod 5? Yes, I, it's incredibly common and almost expected, I think, that you're going to benefit from stronger carb ratios. Mm-hmm. And I think and, and I think the point to, to see here is that it's, it's expected and kind of part of it, it doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong. If you need to change your carb ratios, um, the, the adaptive basal is dynamic. And so with it, when you're coming from MDI where, you know, you give the long acting dose and it's just always there, it's always there, you know, regardless of what's going on with your blood sugar, same with a, with a standard, a manual pump, it, the static basal is always delivering, mm-hmm. but based on whatever's programmed or whatever you as the user change it to. So, um, with a dynamic basal in an automated system like Omnipod 5, you're going to have most likely some insulin suspension, oftentimes leading up to a meal. And so because of that, you have less insulin on board at the time of the meal. And so you need more for the bolus than you maybe did in a non-automated system, whether that was multiple daily injections or, you know, a manual insulin. Pump. So, so the idea here, if I'm, and you'll stop me if you don't agree with what I'm saying, but the idea here is you eat a few times a day, right? And so you're using insulin and taking in carbs, and then that takes hours sometimes to kind of complete its cycle, right? For the insulin to leave your system, et cetera. And so the entire time, the algorithm is aiming for your target, and it could be adding or subtracting basal to get you there, right? Sort of like helping a plane yes. land, except mm-hmm. just as it gets you all where you want to be and your plane starts coming in, you go ahead and eat again because, yes. right? Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. And okay. so it tends to do a decent job at getting you closer back to that target again by the time it's time to eat again. Mm-hmm. And so then, you know, usually need more for that bolus. So I mean, it's no real surprise that, automated insulin delivery systems do a great job overnight, generally speaking, because you've taken away one of the big variables, well, two of them, which is carbs and and bolus insulin, meal insulin. Yeah, yeah. and lots of other variables oh, too, yeah, like activity more. and, yeah. you know, right. so unexpected, yeah. Yeah, so when the variables are lesser, it, it's, it's shooting out in the distance and nothing's going to change out in the distance. And that's how you see that stability overnight when you see it. Like yeah. That. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's also why I see it with my daughter. She can wake up in the morning, like sleep in. And um, it's one of the things that I've seen it alleviate is that she can sleep in and not have food seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock in the morning. And she just sits like very stably the entire time. Yeah, Yeah. that that is a very great point. And then when she eats, though, at 10 or 11. She probably is, has little to no insulin in her body. So it's helpful to be aware of that when you think about having that first meal, especially in that type of situation. So I'd love the CGM graph and I really encourage people to look at it because Mm -hmm. the visual representation of the insulin delivery is really helpful because if you get up in the morning and you look at the CGM graph from the Omnipod five controller and you see a red bar for the last hour with a beautiful, you know, beautiful glucose at, you know, 100, 110, you know, something like that, you know, that you know, you're probably going to want to pre bolus a lot earlier than maybe, you know, you would if you weren't um, suspended for right, a while. Right. That's, that's, it's just important to note. It's important to note that you're going to get to sleep in, which is just amazing yeah. for most people using insulin are like, wait a minute, I could like, you mean, I don't have to get up exactly at 7am to make this whole thing work. You, right. you know, that, that's pretty great. But there's no real rule of thumb, right, to make changes to like insulin to carb ratio and insulin sensitivity factor. This is a situation you go back to your healthcare provider, you make some, you know, they're probably going to make adjustments with you incrementally until you get to where you need to be. But you're still looking for about that 50-50 breakdown with Omnipod 5. Based yeah, on the yep. Okay. Yep. That is typically what you're going to see. And I mean, yeah, I don't think you need to worry too much about changing anything with your carb ratios beforehand preemptively, Mm -hmm. um, just follow up in the first couple of weeks, um, tell your healthcare provider, they need to be helping you. They need to take a look 
and help you like, okay, we've, we started, it's been a couple of weeks. I've, you know, I've given the time of the system adapting to the total daily insulin. Let's see what else we might need to tweak with these bolus settings to really optimize, you know, my outcomes here. Right, right. Um, yeah. Okay. That's perfect. sooner rather than later is what I'd say. Excellent. So let's go over a couple more things. Duration of insulin action. So DIA, um, overall, that setting means the amount of time you expect that insulin is going to have an impact on your blood sugar? Yes. And that setting specifically is related to the bolus insulin that the user gives. So mm-hmm. this is the duration of, I would add, in automated mode, well, really in manual mode too, actually, um, it's the duration of bolus insulin action. So, because what I want to make sure people know is that if you change the duration of insulin action that's programmed in the controller, that does not impact the automated insulin delivery. Yeah. It uses its own, you know, understanding of insulin action when it's calculating its doses every five minutes. So don't worry too much about that setting. Um, What it could help you with is if you're finding that you feel if you feel constrained with your, the correction boluses you try and give, um, sometimes it could be, if you shorten the, uh, insulin action time that can help. Typically that's set between three to four hours. That's pretty, you know, common setting sometimes as low as two, but again, something to talk with your healthcare professional about to, you know, see what would be the optimal setting for you. Right. Um, yeah. When I when I was setting up Omnipod 5 for Arden, I have to admit that was one of the first harebrained ideas I had. I was like, I'll just make the insulin uh, the duration of insulin action so short that it'll never want to, you know, it'll always yeah. think she needs it. No, insulin. everybody that thinks that, either. Scott. It's yeah. not just you and it doesn't it's not just Omnipod 5. Yeah. Everyone thinks that for their um Yeah, and then you know, and it 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 can get confusing because in some systems that setting does have an impact on the automation. So that's where it gets to every system really needs to be approached as its own unique thing. Sure. Um, and for Omnipod five, that is not going to impact the automated basal or the adaptive basal, but it will be used in your um, bolus uh, calculations when it's factoring in okay. um, insulin on board. So let me let me bring up the next one. This is it's funny. I have to stop myself because when I see the words reverse correction, I actually read them in my head as reverse correction off because I've never had them on before. <laughs> <laughs> but reverse correction. Um, yeah. Tell me what it is and where would you set it on Omnipod 5? Yeah. So reverse correction. So here's what it is. It's based on that target. If you remember us talking about the target setting, we talked about how if you program your target at 110 and you program your correct above at 110, then anytime you're above that correct above, you're eligible for a correction to bring you back down to the target. The reverse correction is the opposite. So if your glucose value is less than the target, then it tries to take away some insulin to bring you back up to that target. Right. So that's that's the theory behind it. That you know, if your target is set at 110 and your glucose value that you you know put in the bolus calculator is 85, then it's going to the the correction dose will end up being a negative number because mm-hmm. your current glucose value is less than the target. Um, so here's my suggestions for reverse correction. I honestly, my suggestion is typically to just turn it off. I I don't, I don't think in automated mode, especially that it is necessary because, you know, you have the adaptive basal that's already adjusting the adaptive basal to try and keep you at that target anyway. So I don't think you also need your bolus doses to be reduced. And then because of how you can have you know, how I just had talked about how you can have less insulin on board at mealtime and often need more for your carb ratio. And then it just can make it a little harder if you're also getting a negative correction on top of that, when you already are going to need more than maybe you did before for your meal bolus. Okay. Um, so, and especially if you do use a higher target, like let's say you prefer to have that, have it run at one thirty as the target, then, then I then even more so really look at whether you need that reverse correction because it's going to reduce insulin if in the bolus calculator, if you're under 130. So all things to keep in mind, doesn't mean it's not useful for anybody. Like, you know, there could be cases where it is useful to have the reverse correction on, Mm -hmm. Um, especially if you're in manual mode. I think 
it becomes even more helpful um, to, to have that on. But my default tends to be to turn it off and then like use it if it does seem like um, by looking at someone's individual, like personalized data that this could be a useful thing to use. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, the last setting I want to talk about is extended bolus. A lot of people are going to use this in regular pumping for, you know, high carb, high fat meals, other things that hit later than usual. But in Omnipod 5, when you're in automated mode, there is no extended bolus. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. There's no option to use extended bolus. It's a manual mode only mm-hmm. setting. Okay. So in that scenario, would you bolus like we like I guess we should under like understand for a second. Like so extended bolus, first of all, will work fine in manual mode. It's it's a setting that mm-hmm. you can use in manual. In automated, yeah. it won't. But if you I mean pizza is the great example, right? Pizza yeah. Chinese food, it's where people use the example. You, you you have these foods that sort of digest slower or they maybe give you an impact 90 minutes later, that kind of a thing. So people use extended boluses to kind of spread their insulin out to hit where they think they're going to need it. But if, right. I'm, but if I'm in automated mode and I tell you like, look, this is, you know, for sure this pizza is 35 carbs, the the algorithm isn't going to see, it, it isn't going to understand that there's going to be like a, a fat rise later example. So do you just bolus the fat rise on your own? Well, I think it's, I think it's trial and error. And there's a few different strategies I think that, that could work for different, different people. Mm-hmm. The first thing I would suggest though when you're first getting started and seeing like, how do I want to handle my, you know, my pizza and my Chinese food? The first thing I would say is just bolus normally because, and see how that goes, because the adaptive insulin works very much like an extended bolus. So if you think about it, the adaptive insulin is glucose dependent. So as your glucose is rising, you're, it's going to start giving you more adaptive basal. It's going to increase that insulin, which is exactly what you do when you program an extended bolus. You, you program, you, you, you drag out that bolus delivery for a longer period of time instead of it all being delivered at once. And so in a lot of ways it operates in the same way. Okay. So you could just try bolusing up front and then seeing if the adaptive basal response is sufficient to, to help you manage that. Right. If that doesn't work, you could try splitting, you know, splitting the bolus, giving, you know, half the carbs up front and then adding in another, the other half of the carbs, um, a little, later. you know, a few, a couple right, hours right, later right. as an alternative strategy. Gotcha. Okay. Um, time and range. I'm going to ask you right here, but, but as we're kind of buttoning this up, right? So the, what is the range? Like when you think of time and range, what are you thinking of? Cause I have a number in my head. I'm sure other people have different numbers. In yeah. Their head, you know? Right. And it's, and it's completely valid actually to have your own number in your head of what you, of what you hope, you know, to have your blood sugar control at, mm-hmm. um, from my perspective as a, as a nurse and no, in looking at the data and science, the time and range standardly speaking is 70 to 180. And the reason, and 180 might sound high, but the reason for that is because it includes post meal, uh, post meal blood sugars. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're going, it, you're going to have a rise in blood sugar after you eat, and then it's going to come back down. And so, um, 70 to 180 is the kind of standardized time and range. And then the goal to have glucose levels in that target range, 70% of the time or more. So okay. 70% time and range is the, is the goal. Gotcha. Between 70 and 180. Yes. Gotcha. Now, if you're pregnant, that's not true, but okay. if you're not, <laughs> that is generally, um, the agreed upon like time and range. Sure. Let me see what else we have here. I think we might be coming to the end of this actually. I, I guess let's say, let, let me say this about settings, right? You're going to give yourself the best chance by having the best settings you can have. You know, you and your healthcare provider figure them out at the beginning. It might not go exactly the way you expect. So you're going to need some adjustments. You might need to be correcting some blood sugars along the way, talking to your doctor again about, you know, here's what I'm seeing. You know, this seems like we could be doing better. How can you help me? But in the end, everything is settings. And, and I don't just mean that for Omnipod 5. If you're on MDI, if you're using a you know dash, if you're using another pump, a different CGM, in general, these settings are the most important thing. Now, the one thing that Omnipod 5 is going to offer you that 
I mean, honestly, none of the other systems are going to offer you is that it is going to make adjustments as time passes. So start with the best settings you can. It'll probably hopefully get you there quicker. And if you're not getting there uh, on your settings, then that's where the algorithm comes in and, and tries to learn and, and tries to do better for you. That's that that's a fair assessment of the system. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it's a great summary. And yeah. the only thing I would add to that is understand that it's a it's a new paradigm. You're adjusting to a new type of insulin delivery when you start an automated system. And so even though the bolus doses aren't automated, you're still wanting to pair those so that they work in the best harmony with the automated system yeah. um, itself. And so you kind of have to start using it to see where that harmony lies. So mm -hmm. um, expect that you may need to adjust those after starting um, as just a part of adjusting to a new system, not necessarily like that means something's wrong with it. it it's part of the process, if um, is what I would say. For years on this podcast, I've told people that you have to sort of, you just have to try. And whatever happens is data, right? And I'll say data for the people who want me to say data, data, that way nobody <laughs> argues, right? It's data. So yeah. I don't look at anything around diabetes as failure. I look at it as I tried something, here's what happened, what can we do to impact it differently the next time? I think that every time you ignore that data, you're sort of just damning yourself to have to go through that experience again until you figure it out. So I like to step back, you know what I mean? Sometimes I like a nice macro approach, I like to see the whole thing and just say, okay, you know, well, I've been bolusing X for this meal for so long, either my carb ratio is not right, or this specific meal needs more insulin than other meals do. Maybe my carb ratio works great for 10 of the meals I eat, but for two of them, it doesn't work. And instead of trying to beat like a round peg through a square hole, you know, be part of the process. Like, and I feel like that's what you were saying, that the, the system mm -hmm. does what it does. And, and then there are things that you can do. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with all that. Okay. Yep. All right. That's excellent. Once again, I'd like to thank Carrie for coming on and sharing her Omnipod 5 knowledge with us. I'd also like to remind you that this was part two of a three-part series. If you didn't begin with part one, I'd go right there now. Omnipod 5 Pro Tip Overview. And of course, if you're listening in order... There's one more episode to go, and it's called Omnipod 5 Pro Tip Connectivity. If you'd like to get started today with the Omnipod 5, go to omnipod.com forward slash juicebox. And if you'd like to find these episodes online, they're at juiceboxpodcast.com forward slash Omnipod 5. And of course, they'll always be available in your audio app. If you're listening in an audio app, new to the podcast, and would like more content just like this, hit subscribe or follow. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast.